Can you hear me? Is this speaker working? Yes. Thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. Um, I think most of you know me, but my name is Amanda Jaron. I'm an associate professor here of political science and interdisciplinary social sciences at the University of Virginia at Columbia. Um, it's really great to see everyone here, folks from my DC history class, my DC politics class, folks from um, digital media classes, with Professor Oliver Sell, who is here, thank you so much. Dr. Chazza Noel Harris is here, um, and our dean at the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean April Massey, who has been an incredible supporter of this project. So it's really great to see everyone here. Um, and I also just want to thank um, Ronnie Kraft, who's the executive director of the UDC Foundation. They've really um, been very supportive of this project. He wanted to be here, he couldn't be here tonight. Um, but I'm very grateful for their, for their support. Um, and of course, the chief academic officer of the university, um, Dr. Potter, and our president, President Nathan. We have had a lot of support for this project. So it's very exciting. So um, what are we actually doing here this evening? We are here to kick off the Herbert Benton Biography Project. And this is really a multi-year project um, investigating the life and times of Herbert Benton Jr., who was, you're, you can hear all about him from our speaker, um, but who was one of the first black editors at the Washington Post and who focused um, for a significant chunk of his time on the city of DC, the city of Washington, um, particularly in the 60s and 70s. And so um, he's a really important figure in terms of thinking about journalism in DC, media, politics, um, and history. So it's a really interdisciplinary, actually, um, experience that we're hoping to do here tonight. Um, this event is the first of a few that we're going to do on campus over the next year and a half. We are planning a symposium in spring of 2023, which is going to be a day-long symposium devoted to the life and times of Herbert Denton Jr. So keep an eye out for that. That will be that will happen next year. Um, I want to introduce our speaker, Benji de la Piedra. Uh, Benji is a writer, a public oral historian, and an educator. Oops. We're being recorded. That's good. <laughs> um, he teaches oral history in the Public History MA program at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and he co-taught the Black Land Loss in Washington course with me last spring here at UDC. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, for several years, he's been working on a biography of the journalist Herbert Benson, and he now directs the Herbert Benson Biography Project here at UDC. He's also a visiting fellow at the Library of Congress's John W. Kluge Center for Scholars, where he's working on a book manuscript Another book, a second book, um, titled The Hero and the News, about Albert Murray, Herbert Benton, and Ralph Ellison's interrelated frameworks for the act of covering American unrest. Benji holds a BA in American Studies and an MA in Oral History from Columbia University. He consults on oral history projects around the United States. Um, excuse me. Uh, he's designed, actually, the DC Oral History Collaborative Training Module for volunteers and grant recipients I have received a few grants from them. I've been the beneficiary of Benji's um, training there. He sits on the Oral History Association's Diversity Committee and Equity Audit Task Force, and he's co-chairing a three-day virtual symposium on race and power in oral history theory and practice that will be taking place through UC Berkeley's Oral History Center at the end of June. So that's, that is who we're going to be hearing from tonight is Benji de la Piedra. I'm very excited about that. I want to tell you a little bit about how Benji and I connected and how we brought him here to UDC. We met several years ago at the DC History Conference. Um, it was actually hosted at UDC that year, so it was in this very building at the Student Center. Um, but we reconnected about a year and a half ago um, when I was launching the Black Land Loss class in Washington and I was looking for an oral historian to help with that class. And I reached out to Benji and he very graciously agreed to, to work on that class with me in the spring and work on the project. So what we were doing in that project was looking in depth um, at the case of two black families who owned land in the Chevy Chase, D.C. neighborhood, whose land was taken by the city um, using its powers of eminent domain um, in order to build a park and a public, I see I need to stand in front of the, yeah, I need to say hello to the folks on the back. sorry about that. Um, so their land was taken by the city to build a park and a public elementary school for white children only. This was in the 1920s, when we of course had a segregated school system. Um, and, and the focus of our project was really to look at, um, to interview the descendants of these two families whose land was taken, and to do oral history interviews with these families to find out what the multi-generational impact had been of the loss of that land that they had owned in that community that they had built together in that neighborhood of DC, and then also to think through with them 
how could they imagine redressing this loss today? So that was the, really the purpose of the project. So oral history was really at the heart of that project. And then we trained our students in how to conduct those oral histories. Um, I also want to thank Humanities DC for funding that project, which enabled us to hire a suspension. So this project generated such enthusiasm among students that we now have an official oral history student club here at UDC. If you are a member of that student club, raise your hand. All right, all right, all right. We got a few members here today. Um, we're open to anyone interested in oral history. And um, there's growing numbers of faculty using oral history in their classrooms, including Azadi Lagelio Diaz in English, and Whitney Harris in digital media, and others are really interested in oral history as a practice. So I'm also excited, um, so, so Benji is, is on campus now and is really a resource in terms of thinking about oral history. But I'm also excited because this project is in many ways a project in DC history, this project about Herbert Denton Jr. And I see this project as one of any number of future projects we can incubate here at UDC, um, focused on DC history, DC studies. We are the public university for the city, and I think we have an important role to play in terms of serving as a center for study in the city. Finally, um, welcome. Finally, it's all really about connecting our students to this project and to, um, to the opportunities that arise through it. So I want to make sure to recognize two more important people here tonight. Mariana Barros Tychus, if you could stand up. She is a graduate and alumna of UDC 2021, political science major. Um, she is now working as a, she's working as the project coordinator of, of the project now and doing a lot of the project management. And then Kelly Hernandez Artia, if you could also stand and be recognized, thank you. <laughs> Kelly is also a political science major, about to graduate in spring of 2022, one more month. Six more weeks, very exciting. Um, and Kelly is our first Herbert Benton Fellow. And so she's doing research uh, support work, research assistance on the project as well. Um, through this project, we are going to be hiring more Herbert Benton Fellows next year. So if you're interested after this, if you're still around next year, if you haven't graduated, you're interested in conducting research related to this project, please let me know because we'll be looking for a few more students for next year. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters. Benji's going to speak for about 30 minutes, followed by discussion. We are going to break at 5.20, because I know there's students here who need to leave at 5.20 to do a 5.30 class, so we'll, we'll do that. But we can also continue discussion. We have the space until 6. So if folks want to stick around, we can keep going with that. Um, the restrooms are right around the corner. I think you all know across from the elevators. We do have water. Please take some if you'd like. Um, after our discussion, we're going to head over to Acacia, which is a restaurant a couple of blocks up Connecticut Avenue. You're all welcome to join us there to continue to discuss um, if you'd like food or a drink, a beverage. Um, please turn off your phone if you have one with you. Keep it on vibrate. Um, and finally, I just want to thank the UDC Student Center staff who have helped us create this you know, lovely space here. This space, as I, I hope everyone is aware, um, this is the, an exhibit that was called 12 Years That Shook and Shaped Washington, 1963 to 1975. This was an exhibit that originally appeared at the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. And so what you see all around you is a really rich kind of telling of DC history and actually relates directly to the time period that Benji's going to talk about tonight in terms of Herbert Denton's work documenting the city. So please enjoy the exhibit at the end of this program. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Benji de la Piedra, director of the Herbert Denton Biography Project. Benji. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I need to start by thanking Amanda. Um, it's, it's hard to put into words what it means and what a pleasure it is to work with someone that you really click with. Um, and the same goes for, for Mariana and for Kelly, like to have a good team around you is worth everything. Um, to be at an institution that understands the value of what you're trying to do um, and gives you room to be creative and innovative with it is worth everything. Um, I think Herb himself would be really stoked actually that his story is being um, you know, uh, elaborated uh, here at the University of the District of Columbia. Um, Herb is someone, and, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, um, Herb is someone who frankly, would be quite uncomfortable at the thought of a book being written about him. Um, he was not the type of person to draw attention to himself. You know, he wanted to be the classic journalist, you know, writing the story, but not the story himself. Um, but he um, 
in the words of, of one of his protégés, Portland Malloy, uh, who once told me this about writing the book, I think it's true of his story being here at UDC, um, Herb is someone who would sacrifice himself if he knew that um, he could help other people say what they needed to say. And UDC is a school that, um, you know, it's 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 the district's only public institution. Herb is someone who, as we're going to talk about here today, um, Herb is someone who deeply believes in the values of public education, access, um, affordability, um, inclusion, um, trailblazing, making that way, um, and excellence. And so it's it's really a gift to be here um, and to be able to kick things off, you know, um, with apologies to the folks on the WebEx for having to wear a mask. Um, you know, it is what it is. It's better that we be safe than sorry. Um, uh, before I get into it, um, I do, you know, I always have to acknowledge whenever I talk about Herb in a public setting that it's a special occasion. Um, Herb is someone who is very near and dear to me, even though I never knew him. Um, because when I was graduating from high school, I went to the international school to WIS just down the street. Um, when I was graduating from high school, I received the Herbert Denton Memorial Scholarship, which was established um, shortly after Herb died in 1989. Um, and that scholarship changed my life. Um, I had no idea who Herbert Denton was. Um, back then, we did still get the newspaper at my house, so I knew what the Washington Post was for sure. Um, but I didn't know, you know, who any of these people on the selection committee were. Um, I didn't really understand the um, the just the, the world that Herbert Denton was coming from and the world that he that he had helped to change in the newspaper. And so um, to be able to dive into that by way of this biographical work, um, which is entirely made possible because of the generosity of Don Graham, Donald E. Graham, former publisher of the Post, who funds the Herbert Denton Scholarship out of his own personal money. Um, Don was also a dear friend of Herb Denton's. They were college classmates and um, served in the same unit in Vietnam. They were very close. Um, and so I'm excited, really excited that, that Don's on the webinar here. I can't see you, Don, um, but really excited that you're here. Uh, hope I make you proud. And um, there's also a few other people here that are worth mentioning, a couple of Herb's um, elementary school classmates. Uh, they weren't classmates, but friends, Henry Jones and Ed Moore. Um, Herb's sister, Jackie Alton, um, uh, Jackie Denton Alton, uh, and Herb's niece, Kim Alton Calhoun, uh, are all on the WebEx with us. So um, again, hoping we can make this kind of a warm affair. Um, I'm going to try to not be so boring by reading from a piece of paper, um, but I figured it would be better to do that than to just kind of range all over the place, especially because um, the goal is to write a book. The goal is to write a biography of Herbert Denton and what he meant uh, to journalism and to the city and and frankly to the world, not just even the country, to the world, because um, he got into some foreign reporting too. So just to give you all a sense of where um, this chapter fits in, so I'm going to be reading from the education chapter. Um, and for a long time, for as long as I've been doing this biography work, the question of how do I structure it has been one of the main ones. Is it birth to death? Is it more topical? How do I deal with the fact that there are a lot of things I'll never really be able to find out about Herb? How does one deal with oral sources incorporated with documentary um, and archival sources, paper-based sources? Um, and I've basically settled on this table of contents. And in fact, having the assignment to give this talk today um, actually helped me settle on it. And so. Um, just really briefly, the idea is that chapter one, which I'm calling character, will be um, just a general overview of who Herbert Denton was as a person. He's someone who left very deep impressions on people who didn't even know him for that long. Um, even though he was someone who, like I said before, did not really want to be the subject of the story, he was kind of an unforgettable guy uh, to a lot of people. Um, and people got very different impressions of him. And so the character chapter will kind of range um, you know, through some of those impressions, it, it might just be a series of extracts of just quotes of just different people, you know, giving a brief mention of Herb and, and the description um, just to show the, um, the the multiplicity of Herbs that there are in people's memories. Um, secondly, uh, education and basically chapters two through eight will be sequentially structured, structured according to Herb's advancement through the Washington Post. So his career at the Post, um, he's a summer intern in 1966. He goes into the army for two years, he comes back, and then his full-time career starts in August of 1968. And that's where we'll pick up. That's where we start the chapter on education. Um, and so the education chapter is his work as an education reporter, 68 till the summer of 1970. Uh, the community chapter is from the summer of 1970 until um, 1973. He's on the Maryland desk of the paper and covering Prince George's County on general assignment. Um, and all kinds of things are happening in PG at the time. Um, that. You know, we could, that's a whole other talk to have. Um, chapter four, Descent, is very interesting because um, as one of the biggest stories that Herb is covering in Prince George's, which is the fight over um, 
so called busing and I call it so called busing because really it's a fight over desegregation and the buses become this kind of false issue. Um, kind of a manufactured issue um, while that is really peaking in March of 1972, um, a group of 7 Metro reporters, 7 black reporters on the Metro desk of the Washington post file a complaint with the equal employment opportunity commission, the EEOC charging the post as a discriminatory employer. Um, this group becomes known as the Metro 7. Herb Denson was the 8th member of what would have been the Metro 8 until the night before they filed. Um, and the reasons why he decided not to go along with it are many and they are complicated. Um, they have to do with political kinds of commitments. They have to do with personal stuff. Um, but this idea that Herb is kind of dissenting from the dissenters, I think, is an interesting theme to look at. Um, and in fact, I'm almost positive today, March 23rd, 2022, is the 50th anniversary of um, the Metro 7 filing their complaint. So um, that's worth mentioning. Uh, it's a special day. Um, chapter 5 leadership will pick up when Herb becomes um, an editor first on the Maryland desk uh, in 1974, and then he becomes the city editor in 1976. So in both of those positions, he's um, like the full supervisor of a, of a staff of reporters. And when he becomes the Maryland editor, that's the first time that a black journalist, any journalist of color, is put in a full supervisory role of a staff on the newspaper. There had been black assistant editors and copy editors, but no one had been editor of a section yet at the time before Herb uh, was made the Maryland editor. So that, of course, is historic. And then for him to be the city editor, you know, in the summer of 76, it, I mean, that's the peak of Chocolate City era. Um, what Herb does over the next four years as city editor, district editor of the paper um, is really revolutionize uh, and improve and deepen the coverage of local life in D.C., which very often is to say black life in D.C. Um, so his his work as a leader is really important. He cultivates a whole generation uh, of reporters, many of whom still work um, prominently in, in journalism today in D.C. and in many other places. Um, chapter six, uh, I'm calling obscurity because it picks up with Herb moving to the national desk of the post, which is the most prestigious of the desks. That's another kind of. Uh, dynamic here in Herb's reporting is he really is like a Metro local guy um, and Metro, you know, what used to be called the city life page, then the Metro page. Now it's called the local page. Um, I don't know about the post now, actually, but back in the Ben Bradley era, Ben Bradley, of course, being the famous executive editor of the paper, the whole time that Herb is working there. Um, Metro was like last among equals. It actually had the biggest staff, but it was the one that Bradley cared about the least. Um, it was kind of the least, um, uh, the least sexy of, of the staffs, frankly, in, in Bradley's book. And so Herb fits into this kind of alternative tradition within the post that really cares about local coverage. Um, but when he goes to the national desk, um, you know, that's an important step in his career. It's definitely a move towards um, eventually being an upper management. Um, and he starts on the national desk in the summer of 1980. And a few months after that, uh, Ronald Reagan gets elected president. And I'm almost positive that Herb was the only black, only non-white journalist on the national staff at that time. And it's um, when one looks at the reporting that he's doing at that time, a lot of it is um, seems to be done in the spirit of, well, if I don't report on how black America feels about this era, no one else is going to. And so it ends up being this really interesting chronicle of how um, in the early 80s, the way forward from desegregation uh, from this kind of previous era, which I'll talk about in the education chapter, uh, is not is not quite as clear. Um, and so for now, I'm calling it obscurity. Um, lack of clarity is not quite as punchy. It's not one word. Uh, so obscurity is, is the word I'm going with for now. Um, war uh, starts with Herb going abroad. He goes to cover uh, Beirut and the Middle East, uh, Lebanon and the Middle East uh, for a year and a half uh, in the middle of a major, major war, um, 1983, 1984. Um, and then in uh, 1985, he remains on the foreign desk, but he's covering Canada and Canada is where he stays for the next four years uh, until his death. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why I call that chapter freedom. Um, you know, there's, of course, this kind of mythic. He went to Canada and he found his freedom kind of thing. Um, but also Canada is where he really um, finds uh, the, the love of his life. Um, and this is a dynamic of Herb's life. That's, um, you know, it's something that always comes up in the interviews. Usually I don't. I don't even have to ask about it is that Herb was in the closet and died of AIDS um, in 1989, kind of at the height of the AIDS epidemic, the early, the early period of it. And so um, the question of Herb's, you know, lifestyle and secrets, like I say, he was someone who did not want to be the story. He was someone who um, frankly was really good at compartmentalizing himself. Um, no one got the full Herb. People got fragments of him. Um, and so for that reason, in each of these chapters, I'm going to be elaborating a little bit more about Herb's background and personal life. So in the education chapter, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about um, 
how his father was an educator in segregated uh, Jim Crow era Black Little Rock. Um, the community chapter will talk a little bit more about his growing up in Little Rock, kind of as a sub thread to his PG County community reporting. Um, for instance, the leadership uh, chapter will talk, uh, will kind of tie together, in addition to Herb's work as a leader in the post, um, the way in which Herb as a journalist uh, was often, I don't wanna say he wasn't pitted against, but there, Herb was in, in kind of dynamics with a lot of different leaders. So today I'll talk a little bit about Julius Hobson, but like Marion Barry is elected mayor in the middle of Herb's um, uh, uh, tenure as city editor, uh, elected mayor for the first time. Um, Herb and Yasser Arafat, when he's in Lebanon, is a super interesting dynamic. I think they actually really like each other um, and they kind of recognize each other's game. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, the obscurity chapter is where we'll talk a bit about, um, you know, some of what I know about Herb's um, sexuality and his private life and, and how there's just certain questions that we're really never going to know the answers to. Um, in war, we'll talk about his Vietnam experience in addition to Lebanon. So the idea is to give this kind of... Um, just like a rich portrait and to show that like chronology is not the only way to structure the story. There is a chronology, as I say, in terms of sequencing it by his career advancement, but Herb is such a complex figure um, that birth to death uh, couldn't capture enough of the resonance. Herb is someone who resonates, like the periods in his life resonate with each other and then he resonates with a lot of different things. Um, I frankly have found it impossible to have a boring conversation about Herbert Dunson with anybody. Um, because as soon as I start talking about all the places that he was in, all the different issues that he covered, like, Anybody can latch on to something um, and, and find, you know, something that's relatable or something worth expressing an opinion on. Um, and so, anyways, enough of that introduction. Um, just a very quick word about methodology, as, as Amanda was mentioning, Dr. Huron was mentioning. Um, I am an oral historian. Oral history is my, my, you know, my wheelhouse in terms of method. Um, and so I've really benefited from the opportunity to talk to a lot of people and interview a lot of people who worked with Herb and who knew Herb in various contexts. So on the city staff um, who grew up with him in Little Rock, um, who worked with him in Canada. Um, and so a lot of what I'm doing is, is trying to weave together the oral history side of things, which is a look into Herb's personality and the, and the context that he was reporting in, the times that he was reporting in with the, the focus on his writing. Um, Herb produced about 1400 articles over the course of his um, 20 something, like 20, 22 years at the post. Um, and so that's a big, um, you know, big archive of articles. Um, I do have to thank my brother, Nate Del Piedra, who uh, worked on the project a couple years ago, and he created the paper archive. Um, it's not worth pulling out, but there's like 200 of the articles are over there in my bag. Um, and yeah, again, the, the project has really benefited from a lot of people's help uh, and assistance. And so um, I think without further ado, I, I might as well just get into the reading and then the discussion, which is going to be the more interesting part. All right. After a newsroom internship in the summer of 1966 and two years of serving in the military, including a year of action in Vietnam, Herbert Denton Jr. returned to work at the Washington Post in August of 1968. The first byline of his full-time career there appeared in, on August 25th under the headline, Federal City Courses to Stress Urban Problems. And I think this may have been the one that you found. No, that's a, that's a different one. Okay, sorry. There's a student in the audience who I know is playing in the same sandbox here. Um, so the article provided an overview of the, quote, experimental curriculum being offered by the District of Columbia's new and only public liberal arts college, Federal City College, which was set to begin operations for the first time that fall semester and was positioning itself as an affordable and accessible option for local students to pursue a four-year degree. As many of you here know, um, Federal City is an ancestor of the University of the District of Columbia. In 1976, it merged with DC Teachers College and the Washington Technical Institute to form UDC. Um, and so I think it's just, here goes Herb giving me more kismet, like his very first article is about, you know, um, essentially, you know, proto UDC. Describing the curriculum at Federal City, Denton wrote, quote, urban problems will be the predominant theme. Noting such offerings in the course catalog as the city and group conflict, the revolutionary tradition and communication colon creativity and change. He explained that, quote, in setting up the curriculum, college officials say they gave particular attention to recent protests and demonstrations by undergraduates at other colleges. The most palpable subtext here was the dramatic uprising that had occurred at the end of the previous spring semester at Columbia University, where hundreds of students had occupied academic buildings for a number of days 
to protest the proposed construction of a segregated school gym in neighboring Harlem and to voice generational opposition to the Vietnam War. But Denton was sure to observe in his reporting here uh, that, quote, major factors centering around opportunity and age distinguish federal city college students and, say, the disgruntled Columbia College undergrad. The average age of, of the approximately 2,250 city college students is a relatively old 24, Denton wrote. Most might have gone to college directly after high school if they could have afforded it. In a planning institute over the summer where some of the new curriculum offerings were tested out on incoming students, those students surprised the faculty by submitting a list of curriculum proposals that emphasized a desire for courses that would, quote, upgrade writing and reading skills and knowledge of basic math. The director of that summer planning institute had told Denton that those students, quote, said that they preferred a curriculum similar to Howard's or George Washington's. And the provost of the college, David W. Dixon, uh, Dixon, told Denton that, quote, for better or worse, the student's taste is more conservative than that of the faculty. <laughs> right? <laughs> also in the background here were the civil disturbances and uprisings known at the time as the riots that had taken place in April in cities across the United States after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I think I have a picture of it, right? Yeah, so this is Columbia um, and uh, yeah, the riots uh, here in DC. Um, uh, DC had experienced the nation's most explosive unrest during this period, uh, and it is difficult to overstate the degree to which this event and its aftermath had reshaped the social and political fabric of the city that Denton was returning to after his time in the army. Much like the months that followed the George Floyd Breonna Taylor protest moment in the summer of 2020, the spring and summer of 1968 consisted of an explosion in public consciousness about systemic racism, white and black identities, and the need for solutions to the institutionally unaddressed undersides of the American political experiment. It was a time of great emotions, big ideas, and major change all seeming to outpace one another. In fact, it was because of the unrest that followed King's assassination here in DC that uh, the US Congress in May of 1968 accelerated the establishment of Federal City College uh, for that fall uh, when the college had originally been planned to open in the fall of 1970. By the end of autumn 1968, Denton was solidly installed as an education reporter for the Post. As such, he operated as part of a small and interesting collective of journalists who were set aside from the standard staffs of the newspaper, like City Life, National, Foreign, etc. And uh, this collective comprised or was called Smirsh. A loose affiliation of topical beats that stood, stood for science, medicine, education, religion, and all that ish. They didn't, they didn't say ish. <laughs> the acronym SMIRSH was actually copied from the name of a real life Soviet counterintelligence agency that had also appeared in the original James Bond novels of the 1940s. The Washington Post leadership's choice of this name not only suggests something mildly humorous about their sense of journalistic flair, but also something perhaps more substantive about the kind of writing that Denton would actually be doing as an education reporter. His fundamental beat was not a place, but rather an issue that needed probing. As a reporter on Smirsh, Denton's assignments had him roaming from the city desk to the national desk and back. His work took him all over the capital area, especially the district, and a number of times across the country to cover and make sense of the revolutions in curriculum, pedagogy, student life, resource distribution, community and parental relations, and instructional and administrative leadership that took place in both school systems and universities over the next two years. And so his skills as not only a reporter, but also as a thinker, as an intellectual, as someone who was chronicling his times and thinking seriously and critically about them, would come into play as he helped to write the first draft of this pivotal moment's history. Herb would bring his intellectual perspective to bear on Federal City College's new curriculum again uh, on March 6, 1969. In a long article for the on the Washington Post front page, so as you can see here, you know, that's on, you know, it's below the fold granted, but still the, still the front page um, on the left and then it, it continues, I think, on 810. Uh, the picture looked less rosy than it had at the start of the school year. Denton detailed a, quote, bitterly divided state of affairs here at the college, quote, over a black studies program explicitly working towards an emerging and wholly separate black nation. 
Whereas black studies at federal city had initially been quote planned as merely a group of courses in the humanities and social science divisions. It had quickly poised itself to become quote the second largest division of instruction at federal city and will approach the status of being a separate college, according to Denton. While uh, quote surveys of the greater than 90% black student body last fall revealed that most were interested in pursuing careers in business teaching and science related fields. The Black Studies Department will get 40 out of the 172 new faculty slots open for the next year for a total of 54 teaching positions. Compared to 51 instructors in the natural sciences and only 41 in the professional division, which included both teaching. Young and politically potent activist named James or Jimmy Garrett. Uh, for a comprehensive course of study that would quote not include not only black history and black English, but also black physical education and black mathematics. Taken together, these courses emphasize black consciousness and preparation for the revolution in all facets of mind and life. Uh, and, and only for black students, uh, I, I should add. Uh, the black PE requirement, for instance, was described by Garrett as a series of courses quote to strengthen the body and discipline the mind. And these included karate, stick fighting, riflery, gymnastics, and the African hunt. Black math, meanwhile, was described as a matter of, quote, practical application of mathematical principles to, quote, the social life of the black community. For students, the drawback of this comprehensive curriculum was that those majoring in black studies, quote, would be virtually unable to take other courses at Federal City, Denton reported. Correspondingly, he wrote, students not enrolled in the Black Studies Department could take only a few specially designated Black Studies courses. In a fashion that would soon become typical of his reporting, Denton ended his article with a concrete reality check on the rhetoric, briefly profiling, quote, Everett Watkins, a freshman who is taking one Black Studies and two science courses this quarter. He said last week that he found all of them interesting, but would ultimately major in engineering and not Black Studies. The proposed engineering curriculum, in, in his words, quote, looks kind of rugged, he said, and he doubted that he would have the time to take many Black Studies courses. Recalling the central point of Denton's first article on Federal City six months earlier, uh, Watkins' story helped drive home the point that, quote, most of the students at Federal City have dug into studies that they hope will earn a degree leading to a good job. Yet Garrett's vision of a curriculum that was, in Denton's words, quote, pointedly aimed at structuring attitudes and technical skills for the nascent black nation, enjoyed the support of what Federal City's provost, David Dixon, who was black himself, called, quote, a well-disciplined and intense cadre of white radicals and black separatists who neglect academic principles for revolutionary ends. Through his reporting on Federal City College, Herb Denton was putting his finger on the pulse of one of the most important matters in 20th century American intellectual history. The founding tensions at the very core of this new interdisciplinary field of black studies, driven by questions such as, what exactly shall we study and to what end? Who will do the studying and who will do the teaching? Where do white people fit in? Do they fit in at all? How do we define expertise and relevancy in this paradigm shifting and shifted moment? What is the proper relationship between university and community in our high stakes political context? Denton further explored specific manifestations of these questions in a substantive takeout piece for the post Sunday outlook section on September 28th, 1969 titled black studies finds uh, academic niche. To distill down the trends in the quote scores of institutions, large and small, famous and obscure, east and west, that have hastened to set up black studies programs this fall, Denton focused on three particular programs. First, he looked at Yale University's program as an example of highly intellectual and academically self-conscious scholarship and archival work. Second, he looked at Antioch College's program as an example of those where, quote, uh, in Denton's words, Separation has become the hallmark of black studies, fomented by, quote, arguments that the curriculum is too racist to reform and that a black student educated in the traditional way graduates useless for service to the black community. Third, he looked at Harvard University's program as a third black studies option. Uh, I'm quoting him, quote, as a third black studies option somewhere between Yale's detachment and Antioch's highly contemporary social commitment. 
a program that, quote, envisions considering both immediate and contemporary problems, such as conducting an in-depth study of Boston's black community, as well as other courses that extend as far back as pre-Christian days in Africa. Harvard's program would also be tied to the development of a W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for Afro-American Research, which would hold seminars and bring in visiting academicians, artists, activists, and administrators. Um, and I should say here, because I didn't, I didn't put it in my writing, that um, this also kind of represents a, a middle way because part of what was happening at Antioch and even here at Federal City is that um, like the old traditional academic credentials were, were being seen as not, not really worth anything. What these more um, you know, separatist, militant, radical, whatever you want to call them programs cared much more about like, what work have you done in the community? Those are the credentials on which you'll be allowed to teach in this program. So Harvard was trying to do a little bit of both by having these seminars with kind of community leaders, activists, you know, coming in and, and guest teaching. Uh, summing up this historical moment, Denton wrote, quote, Harvard, Yale, and Antioch represent three general types of black studies programs, but they hardly exhaust the variations across the country. He quoted Vincent Harding, director of the Institute of, of the Black World at Atlanta's Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center, uh, having told him that, quote, over the summer, he saw curriculum proposals for black studies from about 150 colleges and universities. Most of them, he, that is Harding, added, have no focus. Most of them are kind of eclectic, quick responses to student protests. But the black studies trend, Denton added in the next paragraph, is not just a political concession, a move to quiet student clamor. In part, at least, it is also a genuine recognition of a truth brought home by the students, that the nation's colleges and their courses, no less than their faculties and students, have traditionally been lily white and need to change. The dilemmas of black studies involved added layers of complexity when we were talking about black institutions. And Denton explored these complexities in a piece that appeared on the front page of City Life, uh, of the City Life section on Sunday, June 8th, 1969, headlined The Dilemmas of Howard U. Uh, and so the context for this is that Howard had just selected its new president, uh, James E. Cheek. So Herb covers, you know, covers the, um, uh, you know, the selection of the new president first, and then he does this larger takeout piece. And this is another way in which he's kind of functioning as an intellectual. He's doing the kind of basic straight on just the facts reporting, and then he gets a chance to write something, you know, for the Sunday page um, that's, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, of an analysis. Okay, I don't have the page view of this one, but in any case, um, uh, the, the outlook pay or sorry, the city life section, uh, Sunday, uh, article was, was called the dilemmas of Howard U. the dilemmas of Howard U. Well, an agonizing crisis of identity affects all corners of Howard Denton wrote in the beginning of his piece. Well, a legacy of conflict and ambivalence will be the inheritance of James E. Cheek, the new president when he takes over the university later this summer. Denton was no stranger to the lines of conflict at Howard. Uh, because in one of his earlier pieces as an education reporter, this one, uh, Howard, you put under the gun. I know it's kind of small, but it's there on the left. Howard, you put under the gun, published under the local columnette of Capital Education on February 22nd of that year. Um, and in the Q&A, I can talk a little more about Capital Education again. It was kind of this like news analysis kind of sort of quasi column where he was allowed to be a little bit more expressive of an opinion, not just the facts reporting. Um, he, uh, he wrote this piece in which he reported on a classroom boycott by students in the medical and law schools at Howard who were demanding that the university become, quote, more relevant to the needs of the black community and that they be given a voice in policy matters. Now, as the summer was starting, uh, Denton was able to take a step back to deepen and refine his view of what was going on at Howard. The struggle, he noted, quote, is between the pull of a widening mainstream and, and he put mainstream in quotes, and in another direction, a largely undefined desire to come to terms with the urban revolution, the black revolution, and the student revolution. But while the way forward was still murky, the need for rethinking the curriculum was very much real, according to the vignettes that Denton offered of Howard students immediately following this previous statement about the mainstream versus the revolution. Denton wrote, a law student complained to, to a reporter earlier this spring and when he first arrived at Howard, he and his classmates were told about the law graduates who had gone on to successful practices in top ranked New York law firms. But the student said he and many classmates were interested in a very different kind of practice, such as reshaping welfare rights in the slums. A music student complained that his instrument, the saxophone, was not included in instruction when he arrived 
because the fine arts school did not deem it a classical instrument. A student in the School of Engineering and Architecture said that a design project used in courses was for a summer cottage, but he was much more interested in learning how to lay out a daycare center. Institutionally, this dilemma of the imperatives of the mainstream versus the imperatives of the revolution took the form of what Denton called, quote, the difficulty in forging a productive alliance with the inner city. In essence, it was the old matter of classism and snobbery in elite institutions, quote, a town gown strife resembling that at other colleges, both black and white, Denton wrote. And this took the form of, quote, the distance of students from the aggrieved black slums along Georgia Avenue that border the Howard campus. What Denton referred to as, quote, the difficulty of what the students here termed, uh, and this was in quotes, getting their black thing together, was evident not only in the physical altercations that would take place between Howard students and the so-called block boys, but also in the, quote, altogether new kind of pressure that Denton named in his article's closing paragraph. Quote, Federal City College opened last September with a strong commitment to community service and plans for massive expansion. Federal City's tuition is $75 a year compared with about $500 at Howard, and its salaries for top faculty are somewhat higher. Howard's strongly held traditions, Denton concluded, may not be a useful guide in a period when the concept of a black elite is under challenge, when predominantly white institutions are recruiting black students and faculty, and when there is new competition for the allegiance of Washington's black community. Taken together as a body of work, Denton's education reporting, again, uh, basically the end of the summer 68 to the beginning of summer 1970, chronicles a public reckoning with the fact of desegregation's largely unrealized promise in America, well over a decade after the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board decision had declared the separation of races in schools inherently unequal and unconstitutional. In fact, desegregation can, and I think of course should, be seen as the framing issue of Denton's whole life as a historical personage. Growing up in Little Rock, Arkansas, the son of a revered black elementary school principal, he was not yet 11 years old when the Brown decision was issued. Three years later, he was in the ninth grade, the last year of junior high in Little Rock, when the Little Rock Nine, many of whom were neighbors and family, friend, family friends only a year or two older than him, officially integrated Central Senior High School uh, in September 1957. This incident, which I would refer to as the first televised episode of the Civil Rights Movement, replete with, white, uh, with violent white resistance, galvanized not only the consciousness of the nation, uh, as we of course learn in our textbooks and such, but also of a young Herbert Denton Jr. I don't think it's possible to consider, to think about his foundations as a journalist without considering the widespread community influence of someone like Daisy L. Gatson Bates, who was not only the head of Arkansas's NAACP and the Nine's public protector, but also a guiding hand in the state's most widely circulated Negro newspaper. Uh, her husband, L.C. Bates, was the publisher, uh, and that newspaper was called the Arkansas State Press. It's also likely that Denton's view of journalism's importance and stakes were forged by common knowledge of the assault on L. Alex Wilson, a black newspaper man on the central high scene who was hit in the head by a brick swung by a white rioter and died three years later of his injuries. After Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus conspired with his state's legislature to legally close all of the public high schools in Little Rock uh, the following school year. So this is a very little known thing that I only found out when I got to Little Rock is that 57, 58 is the Little Rock nine school year. But then over the next summer of 58, um, the Arkansas state legislature passed a series. I think it was four specific laws that gave the governor the power to just close all the high schools. Um, and this was known as the lost year in Little Rock um, public education history. Something like 90% of black students uh, left Little Rock to seek education elsewhere. Um, so first Herb went to Hot Springs uh, where, he, where he had family. And then from there, uh, he actually came to DC, spent the summer here um, at a program in the biology department at Howard. And there he met um, another black student who was attending a boarding school in Western Massachusetts called the Windsor Mountain School. Um, and so this is kind of what put him on this path. Um, uh, and so this is, uh, you know, uh, after the Howard program, uh, that's when Denton had his first entree into white institutions. First at the progressive Windsor Mountain boarding school in Lenox, Massachusetts, where he graduated valedictorian and then at Harvard, where he graduated with high honors and a degree in history in 1965. Denton is probably the first black student to have worked on the school's newspaper, the Harvard Crimson. At least that's how he's remembered uh, by, by those I've talked to. Uh, and his own personal views on the questions of uplift in the desegregation era 
come through most clearly in a brief profile that he wrote in February 1964, so the end of his junior year, uh, on Roy Wilkins, national head of the NAACP, who was in Boston at the time, uh, again, February 1964, to support a boycott of the public school system that was dragging its feet on desegregation. Roy Wilkins does not look like a civil rights leader, Denton had written. With his dark conservative suit, close cut graying hair and gentle manner, he seems more like a college professor or successful businessman than the leader of the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. Instead of the catchphrases by civil rights leaders, Wilkins is more apt to cite statistics or to recount historical anecdotes. When he demands action on civil rights, he never shouts, we're not asking anymore, we're going to take our rights. He is more likely to speak of the tests that the problem poses for democratic institutions. Wilkins' calm and calculating manner is somewhat unnerving, Denton uh, wrote in his concluding paragraph. But this man who has devoted 40 years to getting things done keeps his passions well below the surface. His pride is deep enough so that he does not have to swallow it when he must compromise. He is a steady and persistent man with a shrewd understanding of people. Wilkins knows the facts of political life. If his placid exterior disturbs those who believe his cause demands anger, it is indispensable when, say, a conservative legislator must be cajoled into supporting a civil rights bill. Wilkins inspires respect and profound confidence, not emotional faith. After a few hours with him, one feels certain that Wilkins and men like him will be responsible for important gains in civil rights long after the summer patriots have wearied of their slogans. Here, uh, the younger Herbert Denton Jr. appears to be channeling and celebrating the spirit of leadership modeled by his father, Herbert Denton Sr., who, because of his own dealings with Little Rock School Board and the Jim Crow local governing bodies, was likely, uh, I haven't actually asked Herb's family about this yet, but I would imagine uh, that his father was likely a trusted advisor to Herbert Jr. on navigating the challenges of dealing with white power structures. Um, so, for instance, like Mr. Dent was one of the few black leaders that, you know, the white school board would turn to uh, when they needed, you know, their line on what's going on on, you know, that side of town kind of thing. Um, so, so there's something there, I think, for me to continue to explore. Um, so, it was through this consciousness that Denton covered uh, the most salient and energetic venue of the po of post-1968 desegregation's reckoning here in D.C., the city school board. Until the time of Denton's rearrival in D.C., uh, after his army service, the members of the district's board of education, like every other governing and administrative body here in the district, and you here in the audience know, some of you on the WebEx might not know, um, all of these bodies were appointed by subcommittees in the U.S. Congress. Following the King uprisings, Congress decided to give district residents their first measure of something like self-governance by declaring the school board open to popular election. The first election took place on November 5th, 1968, and Denton wrote his first piece on the board at the end of that month. Um, and I just want to show very quickly and um, give a shout out to Mariana, our coordinator, uh, for having helped me put this together. So, let's see if this loads. Um, as you can see from this extensive list, um, the school board comprises the bulk of Denton's reporting during his education period. And there are nearly a dozen different issues and storylines at play. So you can see them here. So there's community control is probably the biggest one. That's that's a lot of like parents of different kinds wanting to get involved in their schools, neighborhood school boards getting proposed, um, the role of Congress, um, general kind of desegregation stuff. Um, what, what gets called in Herb's copy as law and order in the schools actually becomes the major issue over which the teachers union is electing its new president. So like disturbances in schools, FCC is its own beat, of course. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the right decision. Um, there's, you know, there's this other corner of his reporting that's like unrest in higher ed, um, but inequality, uh, overcrowding in the Anacostia schools is a big one. Um, literacy, reading, reading tests, different, you know, experiments with educational philosophy, et cetera. So most of what he's doing here is uh, is about the school board. And again, I'm trying to show kind of the the variety of uh, of different topics he's dealing with. Oops, that's the wrong one. <clears throat> So all of these stories, the ones that I just showed you, are in one way or another, uh, or at least the ones about the school board, are in one way or another patterned by the recent historical context set by Hobson v. Hansen, a federal court case decided by Judge J. Skelly Wright in 1967 in favor of plaintiff Julius Hobson. And I know I have a picture of him. Oh, no, I don't. 
uh, Julius Hobson, who was then a statistician working for the Social Security Administration and father of two children in the DC public schools. Hobson, uh, whose photo you all can see back there, actually, <laughs> you've got a whole panel uh, here in the back. Um, right. uh, I think pretty hard to take Dr. Huron's class and not learn who Julius Hobson is. Um, Hobson had charged the entire school system, the entire DC school system, um, represented in this case by its superintendent, Carl Hansen, with willful perpetuation of a racially and economically discriminatory school system. Siding with Hobson, Judge Wright's decision decreed that, quote, the Washington school system is a monument to the cynicism of the power structure which governs the voteless capital of the greatest country on earth. Mic drop. The remedy that he prescribed, that Judge Wright prescribed, consisted of seven de decrees, which essentially boiled down to the abolition of the track system and optional school zones that had helped maintain racial, racial segregation, uh, had basically given white students a way out for majority black schools, um, an order that the city start transporting uh, volunteering children from overcrowded schools east of Rock Creek Park to underpopulated schools west of the park, and an order for schools to develop plans uh, to racially integrate their teaching staffs. In his continuous coverage of the school board, Denton would uh, continue to encounter and report on Hobson, who had successfully run for a seat on the board uh, in its inaugural election. So after winning the case, Hobson runs for board, he wins. Uh, they actually have a drawing that Herb covers. Uh, they, they put all the names of the, I think, 13 school board members, 13 or 11, uh, in like an Uncle Sam hat. And half of them, they basically, they, they draw out the names so that half of them get three-year terms and half get one-year terms. At the start, uh, Hobson draws a one year term and that actually is the, the headline of one of Herb's early articles is like Hobson draws one year term uh, essentially draws the short straw. Um, but in any case, Hobson is on the board um, and from everything I know about Herb, uh, you know, behind the writing, you know, from having talked to people who knew him. Uh, and then once you start talking to people who knew him, you get a sense of what kind of, you know, uh, how he saw things, what his opinions were, you start to see how. Um, he can, you know, the way he sequences a, a story subtext, it kind of lets you know, um, Hobson's style was not Herb Denton's cup of tea. Uh, this much is evident in the way that Denton writes on February 15th, 1969, and I do have a photo of this, wait, there we go, about the bickering that is marking the school board meetings. Herb writes, it was the fourth meeting since the swearing in on January 27th. And again, this is February 15th. So it's the fourth meeting since the swearing in on January 27th. And it was the first time any step was taken by the board to start organizing for governing the school system that most members say is in a state of crisis. About 150 residents packed into the meeting room with many standing in doorways for more than two hours. But mostly they heard windy quibblings over Robert's rules of order and personal quarrels between members. In one of several such exchanges, one member, Julius Hobson, accused another, Anita Allen, of acting on, quote, behalf of those crackers west of Rock Creek Park. Mrs. Allen replied in kind with the loud observation that, quote, I got more votes in the black community than you did. Denton goes on, when the air was cleared and board members voted on motions, they passed by wide margins. In the heat of the harangues and the hassle, the fact most often obscured is that a majority of members actually agree on the issues. Denton also seemed to throw shade at the disruptive supporters of Hobson who, uh, who essentially stormed the meeting and quote, clapped and shouted until the board hastily adopted their proposals for a black studies program and courses in Swahili. It was Hobson, quote, alone, who was, a, who was capable of turning down their steam, something he does at his own leisure, Denton noted. And yet, uh, as also detailed in Denton's reporting, even at the end of this article, actually, and then in, in subsequent articles, it was also Hobson who agitated for a system-wide inventory of inequities in the distribution of textbooks and science equipment across the school district, uh, which soon revealed not that surprisingly, that the all black schools in lower income parts of the city continue to receive less textbooks, microscopes, equipment, et cetera, than their counterparts in upper Northwest. Uh, and so just to kind of transition us into the discussion, um, you know, what I wrote here is in all the sound and fury of uh, the revolution's birth pangs, Herb Denton was committed to laying out the fundamental matters uh, as clearly and fairly as he could. And I think this is a, it's a nice note to end on because um, there's a way in which 
the, the image of Herb that people often remember is, oh, you know, he, he wasn't revolutionary. He was an institutionalist. Like he wasn't someone who liked to make waves. He didn't join the Metro seven, someone like Hobson, he found really, um, you know, counterproductive with his rhetoric. Um, but actually a more complicated picture emerges when you look at the reporting itself. I think you see Herb again, he's not really ever expressing opinions, maybe in the capital education pieces a little bit, because he has a little room to give his kind of analysis and the way he frames the issue. Let's, you know, some of his opinion. Um, but there was no doubt that Herb saw the value of a figure like Julius Hobson on the district scene when he was helping get things done. When he was doing the grandstanding, you could tell Herb had little patience for that. Um, but in terms of all it, you know, what it takes to really, uh, you know, agitate for change in the city, um, especially in this era of pre home rule, um, you know, Herb was, was committed to covering that, I think, and calling it fairly. So um, I'll end there. I think I've talked for longer than I intended to, but um, hopefully we can have some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much to Benji for that really fascinating talk. I am so excited to read this book um, about about her family's life. Let's have some discussion. We can pass the mic around. Um, we have about uh, 15 minutes until 520, so we have some time for discussion before I know some folks need to leave the class. Um, Mariana has the mic here. He went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I turned, a, the, I turned the mic off. As a Harvard graduate. Two years. That's right. So he and he was in combat. Correct. Can you say anything more about it? That's sure. Pretty interesting. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So he he serves for two. Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. So for the Webex, so um, gentleman in the audience just asked me to expand a bit on Herb's um, military service because it's kind of unusual. Uh, certainly would not have been obligatory of him. He could have found a way out, right? Um, given that he was a Harvard man. Um. Etc. Um, yeah, Herb Denton came from a family, uh, and one finds this, and you know, it's a certain, uh, it's a certain segment of uh, Black America that really values service, right? Um, his father had served in World War II. Um, I think Herb. It's a really interesting question. Why? Because my sense is that he actually volunteered for the draft. One could say that if he volunteered for the draft, he would get one year less of service than if he had been um, just drawn. I think is the case. Um, at least that's what I've heard. I need to, I do need to check on that. Um, but I, I don't think it would have been him thinking that it was just, um, it was just for two years at then. Um, so in any case, it's likely that he volunteered. Um, and he is someone who I think, first of all, had this ethic of service. Um, one person I've talked to about Herb said that, uh, Herb had a survival instinct that only barely outmatched his death wish. <laughs> that's one way of talking about him as a figure. Um, you know, so why does he go into the army? That's, that's another question. Um, what's really interesting is that, uh, his pal, Don Graham also joins, uh, at the same time and, uh, by an accident of the computer, they end up, um, serving in the same, uh, basic training in North Carolina. And then they both serve in the same unit, um, cause they each do a year of domestic service and they're separated. And then they, they end up going into the same unit in the first cavalry. What's really interesting. And I didn't have time to talk about it here is that the army service, um, is actually an important moment in his journalistic education because he serves as a PIO, a public information officer, uh, which means that, yes, he saw combat, he carried a weapon, you know, he was part of, you know, the first cab, um, but his main job was to report, um, to write stories. And so he and Don, who served in the same capacity, they could leave the battlefield at any time to go file their story. And so this did a number of things for Herb, I think. I, I get into, I wanna get into this in the chapter on war when he's in the Middle East 15 years later, like it really literally battle hardened him, um, like it made him able to do his reporting in life or death situations when the fire was was being shot, you know, when the guns were shooting. Um, and I think it also, you know, it, it uh, because he had to do so many interviews with and profiles of young, you know, young men who were serving, many of whom were black um, and not from the same kind of strata within their black communities as the Denton family occupied in Little Rock. Um, I think it really just kind of broadened Herb's view um, of, uh, you know, of people and of society. And he even has a line in a letter he sent to one of his best friends, um, Rick Hertzberg, uh, who was who was here in New York at the time. Herb says, essentially, um, th this is right after um, the Tet Offensive uh, and Herb essentially almost got killed. And he writes, um, you know, now that I've had this experience, 
Um, I look back on our time at Harvard because he and Rick had been Harvard classmates. He says, I look back on my time at Harvard and um, I realize how much time I wasted trying to trade in my southern accent for leather elbow patches. And I see this now as a foolish thing to have done, essentially. Um, so, yeah, it really it, it plays a lot into the, the kind of maturing of his consciousness. Yeah, good question. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely excellent talk. I'm curious about um, what his relationship was like with the black community here in Washington. Um, because after all, he was reporting on it and he was also supervising the coverage of it. Do you have any sense of what people thought of him and, you know, where he stood in terms of? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that. That's like a whole book unto itself, I think, right? Um, and again, just different people have different impressions. Um, so Herb lived in DuPont for, for most of his time here. He lived on, um, I believe, 17th and P. Um, but then at some point, and I have not been able to pinpoint it down yet, I don't know if it's in the early 80s or in the mid 80s, but at some point in the 80s, he actually bought a house in Shaw. Um, and that was something that really surprised a lot of people, especially like his white friends were like, why are you moving to Shaw? Right, and I think it's because he, especially as he got older, like. This is something that actually 1 of another 1 of Herb's proteges, Milton Coleman, who succeeded him as the city editor of the post went on to become deputy managing editor of the paper. Um, Coleman, who is himself black and from Milwaukee um, and was just a little bit younger than Herb um, Coleman had been uh, a student activist at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee at the time that Herb is covering what's going on at Howard and all this stuff in the late 60s. Um, Coleman said to me, like, you know. Essentially, all black reporters at the post in their own way had to go through their black thing. And that for me is um, certainly one way of thinking about how to structure a whole chapter, you know, a whole thread of Herb's life is like, what, how did that relationship evolve over time? Um, because Herb, again, he, you know, one way that people remember him is like, he wasn't a joiner. You know, he, again, he didn't join with the Metro 7. Like, there was a way in which um, people could interpret him as being, you know, disconnected, let's say. But I really wouldn't think that that's a fair assessment because I think by way of his work as a journalist, I think that's what kept him connecting with the community. Um, I wish I could be a little more specific, but I'm, I'm gonna have to go back and, and really like look at my notes and start writing that piece. So thank you for the question. So my question is actually about the chapter you didn't. <laughs> I want to talk, I want to ask about the freedom. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to ask that is to cite another um, black figure who's really important in the history of black journalism, and that's Mary Ann Shad Carey. Mm. So Mary Ann Shad Carey, whose house is here in DC as well, she went to Canada as an abolitionist journalist and became the first black woman journalist in the Northern Hemisphere in Canada back before the Civil War started. Mm. So I was wondering, um, do you see his in in the stories, him having any connection to that history of black journalism? Mm. Were there figures in that history that he spoke to? And how would you kind of think about that long legacy of black journalists going to Canada and that question of that long black liberation? Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you first for the um for teaching me something because I didn't know who Miss Carrie was until just now. So I'm gonna have to look her up. Um so her going to Canada, it's really interesting because he the figure that I think he may have had in mind whose footsteps he was following in is a man uh, whose name was Mifflin Wister Gibbs, M.W. Gibbs, who um, Herb's elementary school in Little Rock was named after Mr. Gibbs. Um, Gibbs was born, what was he born? I forget. I know he has a lot of deep ties in Philadelphia, but I don't think he was born there. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, in any case, I. So, so Gibbs became, uh, what I do know is that, um. Before the civil war, I think I'm gonna have to look him up, but in any case, at some point in the mid 19th century, he founds the 1st black newspaper on the Pacific coast in California. Um, and I think it's during the gold rush. Um, and from there, he ends up going up to Canada. Um, he becomes, uh, he's elected to some political office in British Columbia. And thereby becomes the second um, black elected official in Canadian history. This is in like the 1860s. I think it's during the war. And then after the war, he decides I'm actually going to come back and participate in reconstruction. And he chooses to come to Little Rock. So interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think there's something about Gibbs, you know, um, 
Little Rock is the kind of place where like when the school is named after somebody, especially in Black Little Rock, like the kids are going to know who that person was. And I think his having gone to Canada would have been something almost kind of mythic, right? It fits right in with, you know, the idea of, you know, it's, it's, it's the terminal of the Underground Railroad. It's where one goes to find their freedom, et cetera. Um, and one of Herb's friends in Canada did tell me, and I haven't been able to find the evidence of this, but she did tell me that she remembers Herb mentioning that his own dad had done, su had done some kind of continuing education as a teacher in Canada. So that coming to Canada was also something his dad had already done at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of like situating Herb in the time, like in his times, right? Like, I got a really great question actually from from Carlos here when I visited uh, your class, Doctor Kiran, a couple weeks ago about um, uh, did Herb himself identify as gay? And I actually don't know, right? Um, I don't know what he would have identified as, uh, like what term he would have used, right? Um, because this was a time when the terms that we use today weren't the same back then. Um, you know, the question of like. Herbs, um, I mean, this of course is the part where there's the most, this is like what I intend to discuss in the obscurity chapter is that there's so little we know about like his particular day-to-day -day actions. Um, but there's a lot of research. I just saw there's a new book uh, coming out in May called The Secret City, A History of, of Gay Washington, A Gay History of Washington. Um, you know, there's a book called The Queer Capital that actually, I forget the author, but that comes out of an Afro-American Studies Department dissertation, and, it, and it's really a history of gay DC, but from a Black perspective. Um, so there's a way to narrate, you know, the context of Herb's life that I think will bring to the fore, again, the ways in which he frankly had to compartmentalize himself. Like, there was no way he was going to be out in the newsroom of the Washington Post in the 70s and advance in his career. Like, that's a fact. Right, um, he could have, uh, you know, this was a time in the early 70s when being gay was considered a crime of moral turpitude. Um, and so for reasons of, um, you know, kind of, you know, safety and, and, and just frankly kind of prioritizing his career, you know, um, he wasn't Bayard Rustin, right? Like Rustin was out, you know, Baldwin was, was out, but Herb was moving in a world, both cultural and professional that forced him to make certain choices. So that's the kind of thing that I'll, that I'll try to talk about in the book. There and then here. So, um, my question was, was mainly towards his, uh, criticism towards, uh, the, um, towards black studies in general, like what, what was his main goal in, um, in his writings as well as what was his, what was, uh, the main idea of his critiques in your opinion? That's a great question. Um, so 1 thing I didn't talk about here, uh, that is like very early in Herb's career, um. Uh, it's kind of the uh, it's it's a slight birth of him as as a black intellectual as, as kind of a public voice is when he's writing on the Harvard Crimson. Um, Herb is he publishes an op ed in the Crimson that states why he's not going to be joining the quadruple AS, which is the Association of Afro American and African Students. Um, and he is the one black student who just who says I'm not going to do this. And in fact, he even goes so far as to say like this group is so separatist that it actually shouldn't get a charter. Um, mm -hmm. And and what's really interesting is that I've talked to another um, black reporter who was at the post who went to Harvard about a decade after Herb and uh, Lee Daniels, Lee A. Daniels. We had a very generative discussion about how that was a very pre 68 opinion. And Daniel said, you know, that was an opinion that we always knew was going to be at the table. And while we disagreed with it, we knew like it was there and we had some respect for it um, because, you know, it's a time when. Um, you know, the separatist impulse is not quite as strong. And so a lot of it really boils down to like this question of like, where do white people fit in? Um, you know, can, can they take part in a department like this? Um, you know, this idea of like educating for a black nation, like I think Herb would have thought that um, like not worth pursuing. I think he would have seen that as like an unrealistic goal. Um, he's someone who I think would rather, um, I mean, it's hard to say like he's, He's in the more traditionalist mold. I don't want to call him an, I mean, he could be called an assimilationist, um, but I, I don't like that term. Um, he's an integrationist. He's an institutionalist. Um, and uh, yeah, in any case, in terms of his critique of black studies, it's this notion of like wanting to pursue something that's more kind of politically viable um, than like the separate, than the, the, the creation of a wholly separate black nation. Yeah. Benji, while, while folks are, are kind of mingling out, I wanted to highlight Edward Moore, 
Oh yeah, great. Edward Moore had a couple of um, comments here. One was related to Gibbs. He says Mifflin Gibbs spent part of his life as an attorney in Little Rock That's right. and later became a judge. All of us who went to Gibbs Elementary were educated as to who he was and who he represented to the black community. Great. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moore. So I'm, I'm happy to keep the discussion going if, if anybody else had questions, Corey. Okay, I'm looking at this uh, newspaper article and you kind of described this kind of contentious debate amongst school board representatives kind of at the kind of nexus of PC Home Rule. And I'm wondering if you can kind of speak on what you think some of Ferb's reporting might look like now, where we have some similar contention kind of around the country as it relates to school boards and right. the teaching of uh, yes. in school. Yeah, man, that's so good, Corey. Thank you. Um, yeah, what would Herb think about today? How would he report it? I mean, I think first, uh, you know, I have to preface this by saying what he would write in his reporting might not be the whole picture of what he might tell you in a conversation, right? Um, because as the journalist, we know he's, you know, he's a lot of the opinions I know he held from his friends that he might, you know, trade like over beers or something, you know, wasn't what was going into the reporting itself. Um, one analog I can think of is um, when he's covering the issue of, and I'm putting this in quotes, busing in Prince George's County. Herb is really, he's always very attentive to frame it as a school desegregation issue that involves the use of buses, right? And it's not like the buses themselves that are the problem. Um, and in fact, there are times when he's like, actually like fewer white kids are taking buses right now, but the parents are more mad, right? Like what's up with that? It's, it's really about school desegregation. Um, and so the analog to that, of course, that I see is the way in which like so-called CRT has been taken to stand for like anything that has to do with black perspectives, the black experience, black history. Um, so I think if he were covering a moment like now, um, you know, I think the way he would, you know, part of what's tough about Herb's position is that he, in some ways, it's like he has to conform to some of the dominant media frames that are overall kind of governing the way that a paper like the Post is covering something like these school board meetings that are happening now. Um, and I think that within those constraints, I do think he would work hard to make sure that the issue does not become CRT as such. Like CRT is not the issue. The issue is white parents who don't want their kids wanting to learn this, you know, black history. And so while it might take a few more words in the copy, I think he would always like try to do that. Um, the question of the way it gets headlined is a little bit out of his hands because that's the editor's job and that's why it's important that he's a city editor when he is. Um, but that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then the other thing is, yeah, like I need to spend more time with the articles that he wrote to have a better answer for this. But the question of community control and parental involvement in school boards, in, in the schools that their kids themselves are going to, like one thing he writes about is a school that allows parents to just kind of come in whenever they want and volunteer in the classrooms. Um, and I think he writes about this in two different schools and in one school, the teachers feel their domain is being invaded, but at the other school, it actually works out really well. And there's like good collaboration between the parents and the teachers. Um, so the question of like parental involvement, community control in schools, um, is certainly an evergreen one, uh, that I think you're helping me to kind of think back to. Thank you. Any other questions? He was he advocated for looking at an issue from all sides and education and, and putting things in context. Mm -hmm. And and so his reporting, you know, would have reflected all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, not not just the contention or right. one side or the other side, the black side or the yeah. side of the foolish parents, what have you. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, it reminds me that um, one of the. Uh, um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so um, what, what's your name? Danielle. Danielle. So oh, we. Yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, the masks. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Danielle asked, um, you know, kind of made the point that, um, you know, if Herb were covering an issue like, you know, so-called CRT in the school today, he would kind of cover it from all sides. He would try to give it, you know, the most kind of flesh out reporting he could. Um, I think that's that's certainly true, and it reminds me of um, this was done over the phone, so I didn't actually see it. But I, one person I interviewed who worked with Herb at the Post for many years, 
basically did an impression of him because the question I like to ask people is like when you close your eyes and you picture Herb, what do you see? And you get really good answers to that, right? So he said, oh, well, you know, there actually used to be someone here at the paper. I'm not going to say who, but he used to do really good impressions of about half the staff. He had about half the staff nailed down. This is a big staff. There's a lot of people at the post. So clearly this guy could, you know, this person could, could do a lot of impressions. And the person I was talking to said that the person who did the impression said that he had her pinned down to a T from, it sounds like his editing years, Herb would kind of lean back in his chair, um, you know, take a long drive from his cigarette because this was the smoking days in the post newsroom. And he would go, what we need is a piece on whatever it is. So he was always thinking about like, what's what's like that extra, what, what piece of the story don't we have yet, right? What we need is a long takeout piece on this part, right? So whether it's a profile of a certain parent or of a student, you know, um, or whatever, whatever that missing, you know, what, what the paper has yet to cover, that's part of the puzzle here. Um, he was always, you know, trying to, trying to get that, that in there, uh, certainly as an editor, at least. And, and there's a, and there's a question here too. Okay, I have a question from Erica, Wright. Okay. Who asks, what will be the focus of the next lectures on her? <laughs> Great question. We got to start planning it. <laughs> um, I need to look at the Prince George's stuff. And I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, given the situation here at UDC. So that, that might be the next thing it's, it's the next chapter. Um, so that would be good. You know, he covers Prince George's from the summer of 1970 until. January, February of 1973, and then he covers the Maryland delegation on Capitol Hill and the Senate and the Congress until August of 73, and then he becomes um, an assistant Maryland editor, and then shortly after that becomes Maryland editor. Um, in that period, Watergate is happening, and so he's also part of the all hands on deck coverage of the Watergate hearings that is done by the Washington Post Metro staff, not the national staff, because this is part of the Metro history is like, if it had been up to, if, if Woodward and Bernstein had been national reporters, they never would have gotten the permission to follow up on the on the Watergate story. It was because the Metro staff was kind of enterprising and, and wanted to keep covering it. So by the time they got to the hearings, um, Leonard Downey writes about this in his memoir all about the story. National tried to take it over and Downey, who was the Metro editor, said, like, no way. <laughs> We've been covering this right from the beginning. We're covering the hearings. Um, and so Herb, uh, Herb had a little bit of a hand in that coverage as well. Uh, that was in the summer of 73. So. You know, we're coming up, you know, this is, uh, you know, like I said, today is actually the 50th anniversary of the Metro 7 filing their complaint. So that's that's an important date. It's also the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break in. Um, so something, you know, maybe more about just kind of the post history and where Herb fits into it institutionally, um, but also the PG stuff I got to look at soon. Um, and then, you know, I'll take suggestions and this is a good time maybe to plug, you know, it's going to be in a year and a half, but it'll be here before we know it in September of 2023. Uh, we're planning to do as like a culminating event for this iteration of the project here at UDC, a Herbert Denton symposium, which I'm hoping will be multi day. Um, we'll convene panels of both scholars and people that knew Herb and worked at the post um, to talk about, you know, these different topics, you know, maybe a, a, one panel per chapter, um, you know, whatever it is. Because like, I would love to talk like you told me, like George Derek Musgrove has done a project on black studies at Federal City College. He just hasn't published it yet. You know, so if my biography is really going to be as comprehensive as I would like for it to be, I need to talk to these scholars who have already been doing a lot more work than I have on the full context um, that Herb was reporting in. Like, there's no way that his, you know, I don't mean to put him down, but his few articles on Federal City tell the whole story of this era in the institution in the city. So um, Herb gives like this really interesting way to cut across and, and kind of link many different contexts, but then to bring in scholars uh, and other witnesses, participants who can kind of flesh out each of those contexts. Um, that's what we're trying to do in the symposium, at least in a year and a half. So, um, you yeah, know, look out for that. And then, yeah. Yeah, quick question. Yeah. Um, I mean, how was my question? So, I mean, how has his writing so like maybe inspired you as a person? Mm -hmm. and how can you know maybe other people can get involved? You know, in this writing, maybe you know, in the university or maybe you know, sort of outside, they can you know begin to know more about all his accomplishments and, you know, how, how do you make time to, you know, to, to do all, you know, to do all those things? So. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, I really appreciate that question. Um, I mean, I'm very blessed, like I say, in that, like, I'm being funded to do this work um, by Don Graham, uh, who, uh, you know, who's running the money through UDC here. Like, he understands the value of, you know, pursuing her story, pursuing this history, um, but also as an old newspaper man, like, I, I benefit so much from Don's understanding of the time that it takes to like really cook a big story, you know, to, to get all the reporting done, to draft it, to rewrite it, et cetera. Um, and so, 
you know, I started working on this. I really started working on this in 2015, but really it was like 20, that was like the very first I did. But 2016 was when I first went to Little Rock, when I first met people that grew up with Herb. Um, you know, I started talking to Washington Post people, the, you know, the following year. So this journey has really been, I'm 29 now. I started doing this when I was 23. So this whole journey has been like a major agent of my own growing up process and becoming a writer process. Um, and that's actually part of what I'm trying to tell in the second book, um, The Hero in the News, which I'm also writing kind of uh, simultaneously, which is more of like a meditation on how Herb and then these other two um, Black American writers who I think about all the time, Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison, like how they, you know, just interact in, in my, you know, through my consciousness in a way that helps me make sense of the times we're living in. So I kind of had this moment in the summer of 2020 when I was just like writing all the time, like, you know, if, if Ralph and Al and Herb could all talk to each other, like, here's what they would be saying, you know. Um, and not to give too long of an answer, but Murray has a book called The Hero and the Blues, which those who are in Dr. Huron's um, DC politics class, um, you know, heard me talk a bit about this when I visited. Um, the way that Murray writes about the theme of heroism, which is like the most fundamental theme in Western literature, right? Like a hero is a protagonist, a hero is someone who has, you know, a task to complete that will teach something to the community. Um, that has played a big role in terms of my thinking about like what kind of story about Herb am I trying to tell and why? Like I need to be teaching somebody something for the story. Um, and so that wasn't an adequate answer to your question, but it's only because it's such a it's such a critical question you've just asked that I need to go home now and, and write a little bit more about it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Okay. So I want to circle back to the black studies question, because I think it's from my observation in your presentation, I think Herb was actually really supportive of black studies. Okay. And I'm going to say this because he reported so much on it. Yeah. Um, and as a journalist, when you think about the time this time and the emergence in what we would call the second reconstruction moment, like in, like at the end of that in, 18, in 1968, um, we have to think about the structure of black studies. I was really fascinated that he wrote about the different forms of black studies by looking at three colleges on the East, considering That's that black studies actually emerges in the University of California system. So just to give everybody yeah. an update on this, the University of California Santa Barbara creates the first black studies program after a multi-day takeover of North Hall on campus. And the reason I know this is my PhD is from UCSB, the graduate degree in Black Studies. Um, other people argue that the first Black Studies program was at UF, University of San, University of San Francisco, or San Francisco State University. Yeah. So those are the two institutions. Yeah. Now, the reasons why these students were arguing from them is because they came from the Great Migration, they came from the South. And the history is its long connection to HBCUs. So black studies as an as a actual discipline grows out of this question of desegregation. What does it mean to support students of color at predominantly white institutions in but public predominantly white institutions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder when you think about his relationship and just reporting on this. Um, is that because you want to give this larger structural kind of conversation? How can we pull in that conversation into the story in any way that might be helpful for us to understand him as doing much more nuanced work around the question of black studies, which I still think is really important today? Yeah, well, we should talk and you should come talk at the symposium. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, that's that's awesome. Like, um, I had not thought about the geographic you know, limitation of what he picked. Um, I think you're totally right, of course, like he, because I, I think I, this is an interesting question because he's on the Smirsh collective and he's not like just on the city desk. I think he does have some latitude in terms of picking, you know, I, I, he doesn't just get to go anywhere, but I think, you know, he, he might have a little more room to propose stories, to pitch stories. Right. And so, um, clearly he sees the development of black studies as a, a very important story, right? That's worth continuing to cover. And I think um, I often say this about Albert Murray, um, but the more I've been writing this chapter, I think about it with regards to Herb in terms of his coverage of black studies. Um, there's a pretty like shallow, like at a glance way of reading Murray that leads one to say like, oh, like Murray was like not for the revolution. That's actually like entirely false. Like what Murray wanted was very smart and learned and well read and studied revolutionaries because he didn't want revolutionaries making the same mistakes that they had in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think Herb has a similar kind of um, ethos. Um, 
and so that's that's really interesting and i think yeah i mean yeah that's all i'll say for now because i have too many hot thoughts but that's yeah that's a very yeah no thank you yeah So I'll ask another question. <laughs> I was wondering um, if you um, have been able to access any information on what the previous students at Central City College were writing at the time to mm. kind of look at, you know, how that compared with what he was doing. I remember when I first came up, there was a colleague here who was saying. You know some of the newspapers from you know that time, and I was fascinated. I ended up giving them to the library here, but I was fascinated by you know what um, the voices of the student student reporters who were talking about programs about black things. So, you know, they access that. I mean, they have a look at you know every uh, any divergence in opinion, or thoughts, or anything of that nature. That's a great idea. Um, not yet. I uh, haven't even thought to do that, but that might be something for our Herbert Denton fellow to get into to help me with. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, that's like a, a that's a general kind of topic I'm interested in across um, Herb Denton's various contexts. You know, growing up in Little Rock, coming here to DC, eventually going to the Middle East, Canada. Um, he's always operating within a media landscape, right? And so his reporting is always, you know, when he's at the Post, you know, he's not at the Star. He's not. Writing for the Afro, he's not writing for the for the Blade, right? Like it's he's at the Post, and so that means something. And then what he's doing within the Post, you know, maybe he's running counter to some institutional trend. So, anyways, I'll have to say that you're pointing me to the student newspaper uh, and and the work they were doing here. Uh, very interesting. I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah. So I had uh, one last question. Um, when it came to because I noticed that he talked about uh, one of the um, groups being very separatist and didn't deserve funding or being charters. Um, what was his take on other uh, revolutionary movements, such as, say, like the Black Panther Party, for example, mm. and uh, similar movements? It's a good question. I um, He never wrote about the Panthers. Um, my guess is that his privately held view was like more, more conservative. Um, like, I don't think he, like Herb Denton was not, and I'm not saying that the Panthers were 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 this in in any monolithic way. Um, but uh, I guess I'm extrapolating your question in order to say like Herb was certainly not like a you know like burn it down, give it to the man kind of guy. Like he liked to work within the institutional channels that were already there. That's the reason why he doesn't join the Metro Seven, for instance. Um, and so um, in terms of that revolutionary spirit, I think he was very skeptical of it, but not not entirely against it again it's this reason why like he continues to cover black studies and he's trying to pinpoint like what's the best way to do this like there is because he himself says like um you know despite the variance in these programs like they all point to like the very real need for more people of color in these institutions right um and so uh one person i've talked to has said that herb denton was the greatest force for integration in the washington post newsroom's history because of what he did to cultivate talent. That's something I haven't even talked about yet is like the amount of reporters that he hired and mentored, um, many of whom were black, but not all of whom were black, actually many of whom were not black. Um, and what he did to cultivate reporters, again, black and white, who were able to get the story right when it came to covering black DC, for instance, right? Um, and so I think that's that's kind of where he ultimately comes down, uh, maybe as, um, you know, if you want to talk about like these fault lines, um, ultimately he's someone who's like working within the system. He's someone who, um, I mean, one of his best friends at the post, this is like a really beautiful relationship because there's a lot of disagreement between the two of them. But one of his best friends is, is a reporter named Leon Dash. Um, and uh, Mr. Dash was uh, one of the seven, one of the Metro seven. Um, he and Herb disagreed on a lot, but they uh, um, they like to go out for drinks together after work. And so they would have long arguments at the bar uh, where they would just get into it and, and chop it up and hash it out. And um, what Leon has told me when I've interviewed him is like, yeah, you know, Herb really believed that talented 10th shit. Like he really believed that. He thought that that's what we had to be. And I was telling him, no, like it's about the masses and the people. Um, and so Herb, again, it's the the kind of the kind of strata of Black Little Rock that he's coming from combined with his, 
you know, his education, his pedigree, you know, going to a school like Harvard. Um, it's this, um, like the idea, you know, Du Bois's idea of the talents of 10th does, I think, actually really well capture the kind of um, strategy for change that he's trying to embody. Um, and also another thing that Leon has talked about is that, um, like, Herb really did believe, at least at the time of the Metro 7, and again, his, his thinking changed over time. Like, when he's reporting in the early 80s on what's going on in Reagan's America, I think Herb is a little less patient, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think he sees the issues really, so he himself is rethinking things. But at least in the early 70s, uh, when they were going through the Metro 7, um, you know, when they were trying to decide what to do, um, uh, Leon Dash remembers that Denton really believed in moral suasion as a better strategy than confrontation. So, like, that's another way to kind of position Herb in this larger field of, like, strategies for change or uplift, um, moral suasion rather than direct confrontation. Um, and one thing that another person, uh, another member of the seven remembers about Herb in these long meetings when there were still eight of them and they were trying to figure out what to do, um, Denton kept saying, I don't want to go to court. I don't want to go to court. I'm not going to court. Um, and so there are reasons for that. I think part of it was he didn't want the spotlight on him. I think he also didn't want to get drawn into a long, you know, again, kind of legal battle. He, the, he, both before he dropped off from the eight, so it became the seven, um, there had been a, some negotiations with the post leadership. Um, and Herb was basically saying, look, let's keep negotiating. Um, we can handle this in house. Um, but the seven said, no, like we got to take this to the courts. And so um, that's, but that's where he dropped off. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. So, yeah, I meant to say this. Um, so the school that Herb went to, the boarding school he attended in, in Western Mass um, was a progressive school. Um, it, uh, it later became known as like the private school, you know, within this kind of elite Western Mass or elite just general Massachusetts boarding school world. Like it was the one that had, um, it's like where Harry Belafonte sent his kids. Um, it was the school that had kind of uh, the most kind of uh, progressive credentials. Um, the mantra, like the personal slogan of the headmaster at the time that Herb was a student there, and it was so kind of ubiquitous that students had it printed on T-shirts, like it was it was in the air, was adjust, comma, don't conform. Adjust, don't conform. And I really think that, that that's like a bumper sticker for Herb's strategy for like how to, you know, how he operated within the post. Um, just how he kind of operated in his general life, like navigating, you know, um, a city that itself was going through kind of um, these birth pangs of desegregation, integration. Because um, we talked about this the other night, Marianne and I, like Herb was also somebody who really did value difference. He really did like people who were different. Um, and part of that, I think, you know, we can't reduce it only to this, but the fact that he himself was in the closet, like that he himself like had these sides of him that he you know, was always trying to negotiate how much of this do I show, you know, um, again, the fact that different friends of his got pretty different sides of him. Um, so he, he did like it when people, you know, were very much themselves. Um, that's something that I've heard in both, like in the scholarship community is like you being yourself is what Herb would want you to do. Um, and to be excellent. It's like those two things together. It's like you be yourself and you be the best at what you are, what you do, who you are. Um, like those two things uh, kind of come together. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. 